Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we want to get started. Uh, my name is Shlomi Nanar, and I am the Associate Director for Academics here at the School of International Public Affairs, probably known as SIPA. Uh, the Executive Director of SIPA, John Stack, was unable to be here and sends his deepest apologies for not being in attendance. Of course, I am honored to open this morning's event in his stead. This afternoon's event is part of our prestigious Ruth K. and Shepard Rod Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm not sure if anyone from the Rod family is here. I don't see them in the audience. Uh, but uh, I encourage all of you uh, to go to international.fiu.edu, that's a website, uh, so as to find more about this lecture series, to learn more about the various lectures and events we are having here at CPU. Before calling uh, Professor Mohadeen Misbahi to formally introduce Dr. Preeta Parsi, I wanted to convey how ecstatic and honored we are at SIPA to be hosting Preeta Parsi. Uh, Preeta Parsi is one of the foremost experts on the complex, and I say complex, and I emphasize complex, U.S.-Israel-Iran relationship. Turn on CNN, Al Jazeera, BBC, and you will likely see Trita Parsi commenting on this very charged issue. To be sure, Trita Parsi's presence here at FIU elevates SIPA's reputation as a significant player in foreign policy discussions. On a personal note, Trita Parsi and I are also friends, having graduated from the same doctoral program at Johns Hopkins University. Trita, I still remember our discussions about school, life, and family when you would come visit me in my little cubicle on your way to speaking to your dissertation advisor some 10 years ago. How fast time flies. And now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Mohini Misbahi. Professor Misbahi is Associate Professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations and also has SIPA's Middle East Studies Center which I encourage you to look up to find out about future lectures related to the Middle East. Professor Misbahi is our senior Middle East expert here at FIU and himself a specialist on Iran as well as Central Asia and Russia, having authored a number of books and numerous articles and book chapters. Professor Misbahi, the floor is yours. John is easier now because uh, Shlomi introduced Trita anyway, so I'll just be briefer than I thought I would be. Uh, I'm really honored to have uh, Trita here. And this, uh, the broad series is an important educational series, and it's exactly that uh, that Trita was uh, also featured in Council of Conversations just maybe a week ago. The live, uh, live project uh, was nationally televised uh, for actually universities around the country on the same debate about. Obama, not Obama. I think I posted today. Uh, Parsi, Dr. Peter Parsi is a founder and president of the National Iranian American Council and a nationally and internationally recognized expert on US Iran relations, Iranian foreign policy, and the geopolitics of the Middle East. He is frequently consulted by Western and Asian governments on foreign policy matters and has served as, uh, as an adjunct professor of international relations at Johns Hopkins University and scholar at the Middle East Institute and as policy fellow at the Middle East Center uh, in Washington. He's the author of the famous book, Treacherous Alliance, and The Secret Dealings of Iran, Israel, and the United States, which was published at the Yale University Press in 2007, which was a silver medal winner of the 2008 Arthur Russ Book Award uh, from the Council of Foundations. Dr. Parsi's newest book, um, also highly publicized, and consulted is a single roll of the dice, Obama's diplomacy with Iran, which was published this year by Yale University Press. His article on Middle Eastern Affairs has been published in Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Financial Times, James Intelligence, The Nation, The American Conservative, The Jerusalem Post, The Forward, and others. He is a frequent guest and commentator on CNN, as Shlomi said, PBS News, News Hour. NPR, the BBC, Al Jazeera, you name it, it is, it is there. Also, I, I enjoy your, your performance with uh, John Stewart. If you, if you go on the other hand, you go there, <laughs> look at that, that piece. It's my pleasure to have you in Miami and the rest of the day.
Thank you so much. It's a great, great pleasure being here. I, I have to say, I was here, I think, a couple of years ago. There was no SIPA, there was no SIPA building. Um, parking was much easier, but nevertheless, uh, tremendously, tremendously impressed what has been done here. Um, thank you for that kind introduction, both uh, Professor Mesquali and Shlomo. Uh, I do remember your cubicle. You were the only one who had a cubicle amongst all our PhD students. We were all very jealous of you for that cubicle. I'm not surprised to see how well you've done, Shlomo. And, and Professor Mesquali, thank you again for the very kind invitation and the opportunity to come and address uh, your wonderful students here. I don't think it goes a day by in which you can turn on your TV and not hear about the crisis with Iran or to hear about the tensions that have existed to various degrees on the approach to Iran when it comes to the differences between the Obama administration and the current uh, Netanyahu government. Yet if you turn on TV, you're not likely to be able to understand the depth or the complexity of this issue. You should also probably have expected to see a different outcome of this crisis, mindful of the hopes and the aspirations that existed uh, when President Obama first entered office. I think one very telling sign of how things have developed in a direction that has not been to the satisfaction of the administration is that earlier this year, I think it was in January, Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta said that he put the risk of a military confrontation between the United States and Iran at 50-50. That's in spite of all of the efforts that have been done to try to find a different course, try to find a different outcome. Now, all of this is happening, and it's coming to the forefront as a result of the elections. Iran has become uh, a critical uh, foreign policy issue, probably one of the most important foreign policy issues in this current election. And that means that most likely you will only be fed a lot of sound bites and not have the opportunity to go into the complexity. So I would like to ask for your permission today to go into some of this history, explain primarily what it is that has happened in the last four years, but also take a little bit of a deeper look into the complex relationship between uh, Israel and Iran that has very much had an impact on how things have developed and how the U.S. has approached Iran over the last couple of years. This is based on numerous interviews that I've done, both on the U.S. side with folks from the White House and the State Department and other elements of the U.S. government, uh, to uh, officials from Israel, from Saudi Arabia, from the European states, from the other P5 states, and of course also with uh, representatives of the Iranian government, to try to get a full picture, a 360 picture, on what it is that has happened. What are the calculations of the various sides? What are the solutions that potentially could exist? And what are the pitfalls that have to be avoided? Let me start off by giving you a quote from President Obama himself. To the Muslim world, we seek a new way forward, based on mutual interests and mutual respect. To those who claim through power, through corruption and deceit, and the silencing of dissent. Know that you are on the wrong side of history, but that we will extend a hand if you're willing to unclench your fist. Only 12 and a half minutes into Obama's presidency, he reaches out to Iran, very publicly, offering America's hand of friendship if the Iranians are willing to unclench their fists. This was a very bold move, but it wasn't necessarily born out of desire, as much as it was born out of a sense of strategic necessity. Well, some believe that the, Obama, the Bush administration had opted for wars of choice, I think in this case one could say that Obama had come to the conclusion that some form of a peace or some form of a different relationship had, with Tehran had become a necessity because of the different things that had happened in just in the last eight years prior to him coming into office. I think it's important to understand the context in which Obama came into uh, the White House with this idea. The Bush administration had pursued a foreign policy that had very strong ideological tenets. One of those tenets was that you do not talk to your enemy, because if you do, you risk strengthening them and you risk legitimizing them. The United States is the fundamental source of legitimacy in the international system, and you should only say your dialogue with those who deserve your uh, uh, presence and your company. And as a result, 
for most of the Bush administration's term, there were no strategic dialogue between the Iranians and the United States. There were some tactical episodes, but nothing that ever lasted or had any greater impact. Now, whatever one's view is of this ideological worldview, uh, and it may have its places uh, in, in, in different circumstances, I think in the context of Iran, the track record is quite clear. The Iranians had no more than just a few centrifuges in 2000. By 2008, they had more than 8,000 centrifuges, and they were also starting to amass low and rich uranium to the amounts that potentially could be used for the building of one nuclear weapon. And this is very critical, I'm going to get back to it later on. When President Bush first came to power, Iran was squeezed by two hostile regimes. The Taliban to Iran's east, in Afghanistan, and Saddam Hussein to Iran's west in Iraq. By the time Bush left office, Iran had become the kingmaker of the political order of those two states. Its influence throughout the region was on the rise, usually because of taking advantage of America's growing in popularity in the Middle East as a result of the invasion of Iraq and some other policies. Against this backdrop, Candidate Obama does something that no one else had done before. He argues that it's important to put diplomacy back into the toolbox that, uh, of American statecraft. And argues for a foreign policy that would be much more multilateral and would engage America's foes and challengers in dialogue uh, instead of thinking that by shunning them we would actually get them. And under normal circumstances, such a promise, such a platform, would have been political suicide, particularly mindful of the fact that dialogue with Tehran became the poster child of this platform. But in 2008, it actually became a winning card, precisely because of the American population's general rejection of the Bush foreign policy and some of the tenets that it stood for. But the administration knew, coming into the White House, the time was extremely limited. The amount of opportunities for diplomacy were very limited. And in their own minds, they thought that they only had 12 months to be able to get some form of breakthrough on the diplomatic front. If they couldn't get it within the first 12 months of the uh, president's uh, term, most likely they would have to abandon the policy. And there were several different factors that draw them to this conclusion that there was no more than a year for this. First of all, the Iranian nuclear program was continuing to advance. Iran was amassing more low and rich uranium, and there was a fear that sometime in 2009, Iran would come to having around 1,200 kilos of low and rich uranium, which is the amount that you theoretically need in order to build one nuclear bomb. Once you're in possession of that amount, the fear in the White House was that the pressure for military action would grow significantly. And they needed to do something to reduce that amount to get some sort of a deal with the Iranians in which they would ship it out, and they needed to do it fast. Moreover, there was a lot of pressure from some of the US's own allies that were quite hesitant about the idea of diplomacy with Iran. This is particularly true in the case of Israel and Saudi Arabia, who for various reasons, different reasons, were afraid that any deal that would be struck between the United States and Iran would have a strategic negative impact on their own standing in the region and on their own security. In the case of Israel in particular, this dates back several decades. It's a pretty unknown history that Iran and Israel actually used to be very close allies during the time of the Shah. They were close allies because they saw common strategic imperatives in the region. Both of them were very afraid of Soviet penetration in the region, and both of them sensed a great sense of threat from some of the strong Arab states in the region, particularly the more Arab nationalist states, such as Iraq under Saddam Hussein and Egypt under Nasser. And this gave birth to a very extensive security collaboration uh, between the Iranians and the Israelis that lasted, of course, up until the 1979 revolution in Iran. But even after that, even after that, because of the continuation of the geostrategic rationale for that collaboration, there was still extensive dealings between Iran and Israel throughout the 1980s. Um, at the height of the Iranian revolution, at the height of the Iranian revolution's very venomous rhetoric, 
against the Jewish state. Some of the things you hear today are quite incomparable to some of the statements that Ayatollah Khomeini himself was saying about Israel at the time. But during that period, for several different reasons, primarily geostrategic, the Israeli calculation was that Iran nevertheless served a critical purpose for Israel as a state that could balance Iraq. The big fear from the Israeli side, understandably was, that if Iraq won the war against Iran in the 1980s, Iraq would become one of the most powerful states in the region. It would have access not only to its own humongous coal reserves, but also to those of Iran. And as a result, Iraq could emerge as a very, very potent challenger of uh, the Jewish state. The entire rationale for allying with Iran from the very beginning was for a way of finding a balance against Iraq and other Arab states. And as a result, throughout the 1980s, in spite of the rhetoric coming out of Tehran, there was still armed dealings between Israel and uh, Iran. There was still efforts by the Israelis, for instance, to convince the United States at the time to talk to Iran, to even sell arms to Iran, and not to pay too much attention to the rhetoric because however horrific the rhetoric was, it wasn't fully reflective of the actual policy that the Iranians were pursuing. This all changes then in the 1990s, with the geostrategic shifts that take place in the region, with um, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the defeat of Saddam Hussein. Suddenly, Iran and Israel emerge as two of the more powerful states in the region, and a very vicious geopolitical rivalry uh, takes hold that we are seeing the climax of right now. And one of the fears from the Israeli side throughout all of this has been that if the United States strikes a deal with the Iranians, the US's red lines ultimately are not going to be the same as those of Israel. Whereas from the Israeli side, there is a red line more in line of what the Bush administration pursued, which is that there shouldn't be any nuclear enrichment in Iran at all, out of the fear that if Iran is permitted to keep this technology, even if it doesn't have a nuclear weapon, by having the knowledge to build it, by having the um, material to build it, Iran will soon then become a virtual nuclear power. And that will shift the balance of power in the region to Iran's benefit and to Israel's detriment. And, and this could limit Israel's maneuverability in the region in many different ways. You can just imagine what would have happened in 2006 during the Lebanese war if there had been not only a nuclear capable Iran at the time, but also one that more or less had a tacit acceptance by the United States. And that brings us to the second reason, I think, from the Israeli side, there is a significant fear about what this diplomatic track would do. And that is the fear of abandonment. The Israelis asked themselves a very justifiable and rational question. The question is, if the United States and Iran manage to strike a deal on the nuclear issue, obviously it wouldn't lead to some form of a love fest between Tehran and Washington, but it would significantly reduce the tensions between the two in one critical area. And then the Israelis ask themselves the question, if there is such a reduction of tension between, Israel, uh, between the United States and Iran, will that be followed by a proportionate reduction in Iranian animosity towards the Jewish state? And the answer, in their minds, is no. Those tensions will continue to exist, but then Israel will be felt, will be in a much more lonely position in facing that threat, because the United States will have resolved some of its own tensions with, with Iran and have moved on to other issues. And this, till this day, has very much colored what we're seeing, some of the tensions that exist between the Obama administration and the Netanyahu government when it comes to the approach of Iran. But Israel was not alone in having hesitancy about this. The Saudis had their own reasons for this, even among some of the Europeans, uh, particularly the French, were very skeptical, and at times even hostile to the idea, fearing that Obama would be so eager to strike a deal with Tehran that he would sacrifice several of the agreed upon red lines and interests between the Western powers. In fact, among all of America's close allies, many of them wished Obama well, but very few of them actually wished him success. And that's the starting point for his diplomacy with Iran. One of the first things the administration recognizes 
as they start, just knowing very well that there is a lot of alliance management that needs to be done to make sure that this could be successful, beyond all of the difficulties in the negotiations themselves with Tehran, is to recognize that the language that both the Iranians and the United States have been using vis-a-vis -vis each other is a language of conflict. It's a language that is not conducive to the success of diplomacy. For decades, the Iranians have been calling the United States the great Satan at almost every Friday prayer. The United States has put Iran in the axis of evil, and if not in the axis of evil, Iran has been a rogue nation, a pariah state, etc., etc. And one of the first things the administration did is to review this and see if they could change the language in such a manner that would make diplomacy more feasible. And to give you an example, Candidate Obama on numerous occasions said in the debates and in the interviews before he became president that he would negotiate with Iranians using carrots and sticks. This is a common American expression, it doesn't have any particular negative connotation to it, but as soon as he came into office he was informed or he was discovered that that expression, carrots and sticks, really doesn't translate that well culturally or linguistically into Persian. It essentially means Iran is a donkey and the U.S. is either going to lure it or punish it into submission. Within two weeks, that term was eliminated from the State Department's talking points. Until this day, I've not seen a single senior U.S. official use that term in regard, in the context of the policy of Iran. But the most um, famous step, of course, is the speech that the President gave in March 2009, a three and a half minute video, a, a new rules message, a new year message um, on the eve of the Iranian New Year, in which he said several important things. He expressed uh, an admiration for Iranian civilization, expressed the interest of seeing the US and Iran move towards a much more friendly relationship. He addressed both the regime and the people. Uh, and he also mentioned that the problems between the United States and Iran are very real, but they cannot be resolved through threats alone. It was a very clear departure from the approach of the previous administration. The response from the Iranian side came only 24 hours later. It was probably not what the administration had hoped for. Um, Iran's Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei gave a speech in his hometown of Mashhad, in which I think he spent the first 20 or so minutes going over a laundry list of every sin the U.S. has committed against Iran from his perspective. But towards the end, he gave a very important opening, in which he said that he does not know who actually is making the decisions and running the policy in the United States. Is it the President? Is it Congress? Or are there other forces in the shadows, he said. <laughs> Expressing doubt, essentially, about Obama's ability to deliver. But then saying that if there is a real change, meaning something beyond the tone, something beyond the atmospherics, if the U.S. change, Iran will change as well, he said. And that became a theme of the Iranian response to um, uh, Obama's rhetoric, saying that they're all in favor of change, but they have to be substantive and strategic, not just tactical and um, language changes. The real challenge for the administration, though, was to decide at what point do they start negotiations. Elections were coming up in Iran in June of 2009, and the decision was to wait until after the election before they started it. Even though they knew that meant that six months of the very precious 12 months would have been lost. The expectation, of course, was that by June 13th, the day after the elections, the, there would be some clarity in Iran. Someone would have won the election, some three people would have lost the election, and very soon thereafter, they could move forward with some real reforms. That's, of course, not what happened there. Instead, you had fraud in the elections, followed by massive human rights abuses. The, um, the entire world could see how the Iranian government was treating its own people with the abuses that were taking place on the streets and beyond, that were captured by young people with cell phones who all became high reporters put their U the videos on YouTube and on Facebook, and soon thereafter, they made it all the way to CNN. And it created complete political paralysis inside of Iran. Now, I know there's a debate as to whether there really was any fraud or not. I'm not going to get into that debate, but let me give you a couple of anecdotes based on interviews that I did with several people in Iran at the time who were in uh, Musari's headquarters and some of his very close advisors. 
On the morning of election day, Friday, June 12, uh, about a dozen security officers attack one of Musavi's headquarters in Tehran. They go in there with the pretext of saying that there is a TV studio operating out of the headquarters that don't have a license. There was no such thing. All there was was a bunch of young people who were producing YouTube videos as a way to get out the vote. There wasn't a TV studio. What happened though was that volunteers at Musavi's headquarters wrestled down the security officers, tied them up, and locked them down in the basement of the building. They call the Iranian head of the judiciary to ask what to do. He tells them, well, this is a police matter. You have to call the police, the police will handle it. They call the police, the police shows up, they bring up these security officers from the basement, the police takes them, unties them, and releases them on the spot outside of the building, and they disappear into the crowd. A couple of hours later, they're back, but this time with reinforcement, and they start to arrest the first and second circle of advisors to both Mustafi, which was the main green candidate, but also to another reformist candidate named Kalubi, which ended up becoming a very decisive blow to their movement, but because in the absence of those circles of people around them, they were quite disconnected from the grassroots. And as the repression increased and became more intensified, their ability to communicate within the movement became highly compromised. The, uh, that same evening, uh, TV anchors in uh, Iran were instructed to announce that Ahmadinejad had won the elections with 62.5% of the vote. And this was actually before all the polls had closed. Now, I know I'm in Florida right now, and I know you guys have some experience with vote counting. And I'm not going to say that you guys are on par with them, but the idea that the Iranians could, do, uh, could count about 40 million votes, handwritten votes, in just a couple of hours, actually before, uh, all of the polls have closed, is a degree of efficiency that I don't think the Iranian government has ever exhibited in any other area. So I find, I find it highly questionable. And then the fact that the arrest warrants for those people around Musavi had been issued about four or five days before the elections is also something that needs to be explained if one is of the view that this was a completely um, uh, perfect election with no fraud in it. Now, the problem this creates for the Obama administration, though, is on two levels. On the first hand, there was no political clarity in Iran. Iran was completely politically paralyzed with its political elite at war with itself, literally. And more time is now lost. They were hoping to be able to start diplomacy as soon as possible after the elections, knowing they only had six months left. And now even more time was being lost. And more importantly, they had no idea under what circumstances Tehran would come under some sense of normalcy that would enable them to come to the table. And then it was also the moral question. This was actually a very heavy moral blow, or a blow to the moral comfort of the administration. It was one thing to argue in favor of diplomacy in the abstract. It was quite different to actually engage in it at a moment when your counterpart is engaged in such open human rights abuses. And this created a, quite a, a question mark within the administration, but even more so within Congress, that became very hostile to the administration's line after the elections. But something had happened just 10 days before the elections that had given the administration the absolute conviction that they had to try the policy. Because an opportunity had risen that they had not expected. On June 2nd, 2009, the Iranians sent a letter to the IAEA the International Atomic Energy Agency, saying that they have run out of fuel for their Tehran research reactor. It's a reactor that actually was given to the Iranians by the United States in 1967. It's producing medical isotopes for approximately um, 850 to 900,000 cancer patients in Iran. The Iranians had run out of fuel, and they were asking the IEA to inform all suppliers that they wanted to buy the fuel uh, for this reactor. The head of the IEA only informs the US and Russia about this because he realizes the opportunity, and so does the White House, they're going to see it. As I mentioned earlier on, the White House had already been thinking about what can they do to reduce the LEU count in Iran, the amount of low enriched uranium that they have. This was an opportunity because fuel paths are built off of LEU. And the administration very quickly came 
to the conclusion that this could be a great opportunity to tell the Iranians, instead of selling you the fuel pads, we will take your own lower rich uranium, we will turn it into fuel pads, and then we will send it back to you. You will get what you want. You want fuel pads so that you can continue to help your cancer patients. We will get what we want. We will reduce your LEU count. You will be further away from having the ability to build a bomb, which then adds more time to the nuclear call. Everyone wins. Immediately, the US and Russia starts drafting an idea uh, on how to present this. And the question mark then is, when do you take this to the Iranians? Time passes. July passes. There's more chaos and political infighting in Iran. By August, the administration makes a decision. They cannot wait any longer. Even though they knew that the likelihood that Iran actually could negotiate was very limited, they felt that if they did not try, they may not have an opportunity to try at all because time would run out. So they send signals to Iran that they, will, they want to have negotiations. Early September, the Iranians accept. And on October 1st, 2009, for the first time, the U.S., together with the entire Security Council states and Germany, sit down with the Iranians in Geneva to start negotiations. Uh, and that's where the U.S. proposes the idea of a fuel swap in principle. The Iranians agree in principle to the idea. Four details were not given at the meeting. They also agreed to open up a new um, nuclear facility for inspections and to have another meeting within two to three weeks at the technical level to hash out the details. This was actually done very quickly over one day. Uh, most of the afternoon of that day was actually spent on negotiating a press release that was probably no more than 200 words to make sure that the press release was accurate uh, and that everyone could agree with that. Most of the diplomacy actually was on the press release than on actually the substance of the issue. On October 19th, they meet in Vienna, and this is the point in which the U.S. for the first time actually presents the details of the proposal to the Iranians. The details were that the U.S. would take out 1,200 kilos of Iranian LEU, they had about 1,500 at the time, take it to Russia, the Russia would re-enrich it, take it to France, the French would turn it into fuel pads, and a year later, the Iranians would get their fuel pads back. The Iranians had massive objections to this at this point. The key objection was, this proposal puts the lion's share of the risk on Iranian shoulders. Just as much as Iran does not trust the West, the West does not trust Iran. And the Iranians were saying, what are the guarantees that after we have given you the low enrich uranium, that you within those 12 months will not grenade the deal? What are the guarantees that we will actually get the fuel? And they give their own counter proposals, saying instead of having every the 1,200 shipped out in one shipment, there should be three shipments of 400 kilos, uh, after which the Iranians would get fuel pads right away. For both technical and political reasons, the U.S. could not accept this. In fact, neither side gave anything significant over the course of three days of negotiations. There was no real give and take. This was more of an exchange of ultimatums between the two sides. By the third day, uh, al Barade says, well, clearly we haven't reached a conclusion, but instead of calling it quits, we'll say that we'll take it back to our capitals to see if there can be an agreement three days later. Three days pass, the US, Russia, and France accept the proposal, which was very simple. They accepted their own proposal. The Iranians do not say yes. They don't say no. They don't send anything in writing. They ask for more meetings. And by mid-November, 11 months of the president's full year has passed. He has nothing to show for. This was not just something that he was criticized for by McCain in the elections, but also his own pick for Secretary of State had actually had a rather different approach to Iran in the primaries. And the president had nothing to show for his policy. And at that moment, the policy essentially is abandoned. The president activates what was called the pressure trap, and from there on the objective was to make sure that we got uh, strong UN Security Council sanctions in order to punish the Iranians for not having agreed to the fuel swap. The hope was that by February of 2010, when the French were holding the presidency of the Security Council, a new sanctions resolution would be passed. And the administration was under tremendous pressure from Congress to do this as quickly as possible. 
Congress was more than happy to pass no sanctions. I don't think there's ever been a sanction that Congress has not liked, particularly not in Iran. And they were pressuring the administration to go as quickly as possible. But the administration was saying, is that me? That's something else. Um, the administration was saying it was critical that congressional sanctions come after the Security Council sanctions. Because if you have Congress passing sanctions first, who could create significant divisions within the Security Council and actually lose much of the uh, coalition that the administration had built. But time passes. The Russians and the Chinese are objecting. Um, Israel is pushing for uh, sanctions to go through Congress first. The administration is opposing that line. March passes, April passes, and by May, it's starting to get a little bit desperate. But at that last moment, I asked for some sound effects, but not these sound effects. Um, at that last moment, something else happens that the administration did not expect. Two countries in the Security Council, Turkey and Brazil, decide that they're going to give their own go at diplomacy and try to find a way to salvage the fuel swap in order to avoid not only sanctions, but what they feared would be a path towards a military competition. On May 16, the president of Brazil, Lula, travels to Iran the day after Erdogan of Turkey joins him, and they begin 18-hour marathon negotiations with Iranians, trying to convince them to agree to the fuel swap with some minor modifications. And lo and behold, by the end of the negotiations, the Iranians agree. They sign an agreement, um, based on benchmarks of the American proposal from only seven months earlier. And Turkey and Brazil are ecstatic. Not only are they rising um, economic powers, but now they have also shown that they are powers that can resolve conflicts at the highest international level in manners that European powers for years who had tried could not. This was a point of pride for them. They really shown that really arrived on the international scene. The second person that Celso Amorim, the Brazilian foreign minister, calls when he leaves Tehran is Secretary Clinton. He explains to her the negotiations and the details of the deal. And the details of this deal was very similar to the previous one. It was that Iran would ship out 1,200 kilos of LEU, but instead of sending it to Russia, they would send it to Turkey. Russia would use its own uranium to build a fuel pass together with the French, and the French wouldn't send it to the Iranians until a year later, just like the previous deal. The only difference was this. The Iranian LEU would be sitting in Turkey. <coughs> if the West reneged on the deal, Iran would get its LEU back from the Turks. It would be under IAEA control, but it would create the mechanism that would guarantee that neither side would have any incentives to undermine the deal. In fact, I think there's good reasons to believe that this variation of it was actually originally also an American idea, and I'll get back to that later. But to Amorim's great surprise, Secretary Clinton made it absolutely clear in that phone call, the deal is completely unacceptable. And Amorim was quite shocked. What the Brazilians and the Turks didn't know was that two days before they arrived in Tehran, <coughs> Russia and China had given their final green light to the UN Security Council resolution. And the administration had now to choose between a UN resolution against Iran or a breakthrough in the diplomatic field on the nuclear issue. And they chose the sanctions. Two days afterwards, Clinton is giving a speech or a testimony in the Senate, and in that testimony she announces that we now finally have an agreement on a resolution. It will be circulated this afternoon. And then she adds, this is the clearest answer we can give to the negotiations of this past weekend, or to the developments of this past weekend, referring to the negotiations. The Turks and the Brazilians were deeply, deeply upset. And there was a lot of tensions, and there was a lot of very open tensions in the media in the U.S. at the time. A lot of criticism against Lula accusing him of being a megalomaniac, the Turks were also in a very bad position because this all happened at the same time as the uh, 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 Gaza flotilla incident, uh, which put Turkey in uh, a pretty bad light in Washington. 
And he got so bad that at some point, about a week later, someone in Lula's bureaucracy in Brasilia leaks a letter to the Brazilian press. It's a letter from President Obama. It's dated April 20th, only three and a half weeks before uh, Lula goes to Tehran. Signed by the president. And in that letter, Obama asks Lula that it would be a great idea if you go to Tehran, that you convince the Iranians to ship out 1,200 kilos of LU, put it in Turkey, convince the Iranians that they're not going to get back their fuel pads until a, week, a full year later, and that the French and the uh, uh, Russians will be involved in the production of the fuel pads in the meantime. Exactly what Lula and Erdogan delivered. They actually even followed that letter as a roadmap in the negotiations. At one point, the Turks put forward their version of the letter, because Erdogan had received one as well. Presented it to the Iranians and said, if you agree to this deal, we already have Washington's agreement. And this was critical for the Iranians, because they had been trying to get negotiated with the Europeans, uh, thinking that the Europeans could deliver the US, which the Europeans could not. And having that letter in hand, uh, was quite effective. So why then didn't the Obama administration agree to a deal that it only three and a half weeks earlier had told the Turks and the Brazilians that they would go along? Well, the administration's public objection was that the deal had lost, had passed its uh, expiration date because Iran had now 2,400 kilos of energy. You take out 1,200, they still have 1,200. So you don't really add much time to the nuclear call. Moreover, the Iranians had started enrichment at the 20% level, which was viewed as a significant escalation and a provocation. And this is not addressed in the deal either. But neither is it addressed in the letter. The president does not make any mention in the letter that the fuel count in Iran is now above 20, uh, 1,200 kilos. It doesn't make any mention whatsoever about the 20% issue. The real issue was this. And it's not to say that the arguments about technicality have no validity, they do. But the real issue was that the president had to make a decision. Which promise do I break? I have a promise to Congress that they're going to get to pass their sanctions on Iran. They just have to wait until the first get the UN sanctions. I have an implicit promise to the Turks and the Brazilians. Six months before elections, uh, midterm elections, the president was not going to break his promise to Congress. And as a result, it was the promise to the Turks and the Brazilians that would be broken, and they went forward with the sanctions. The administration also thought that had he accepted the deal, Congress would have gone forward with their own sanctions anyways. And those sanctions would have targeted Russia and China, and there would have been a significant conflict within the Security Council, which would have undermined the unity that the President had managed to build within the Security Council against Iran, a unity that did not exist during the Bush years. The Iranians would then again be able to play the various Security Council powers against each other, and that would have created even greater difficulty. This, of course, is based on the assumption that the President simply could not have gone to Congress and said, actually, we've got a breakthrough. We've got a breakthrough, and if you pass sanctions now, you're going to violate, you're going to undermine our opportunity to resolve the nuclear issue. The President did not believe that at that moment he had the opportunity to do so because he had spent so much political capital on the health care debate. And as a result, without much thinking, very quickly, the deal was rejected. And here we are, two years later. And there's an assumption, there's a belief that diplomacy has failed, that even diplomacy has been exhausted. I would make the argument that diplomacy was abandoned, and it was abandoned for domestic political reasons both by Tehran and by the United States. The objections that the Iranians gave in 2009 was also technically not incorrect. The trust issue should not be underestimated. But the real reason why the Iranians said no in 2009 was not because of that. It was because none of the other political factions in Iran at the time wanted to see Ahmadinejad be able to get a political win that could really strengthen him. And they all turned against the deal, not necessarily to undermine it, but to make sure that if Ahmadinejad got it, it would not benefit him in any way, it would actually cost him something. It was domestic political reasons, the domestic political paralysis 
that started the deal in October 2001. There were domestic politics in May 2010 that did exactly the same thing here in the United States. A senior official in the Obama administration told me that by the time Obama had managed to get everyone to the table in October 2009, the entire policy had become a gap. I've become a gamble on a single road. Okay. By the, oh, this is much better. By October 2009, the entire policy had become a gamble on a single roll of the dice. The diplomacy had to work right away or not at all. And there's been no instance in U.S. history in which an issue of this complexity has succeeded, has been resolved in that type of a fast food diplomacy manner. It's never happened, and it probably won't. Diplomacy needs the exact same type of a commitment that any other type of policy needs. And in fact, in those cases where the U.S. has been very successful with diplomacy, has managed to turn enemies into friends, or resolve major historical disputes, the two key components of that diplomatic effort has been the political will to succeed and see through the toughest of times, as well as the patience of realizing that deep problems do not change quickly. It took the United States exactly four years to negotiate um, and normalize relations with Vietnam after the war, between 1990 and 1994. Another six years to get a full trade agreement. It took actually almost on the day seven years of negotiations with uh, Libya to get the Libyans to capitulate a nuclear program. During those seven years, there were several periods in which there were no talks because they broke down or because of political reasons they had to be put on pause. There's a wonderful quote from uh, Senator Mitchell who mediated the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland, ending a very, very long and deep historical conflict there. He said that for the first 700 days, both sides told me they would never agree to anything the other side would agree to. On the 701st day, they both changed their mind. Fortunately for the US, for the people of Northern Ireland, Senator Mission did not give up during those first 700 days. He had the patience, he had the political capital and the backbone to stick with it. Neither Tehran nor Washington, in my estimation, has shown that type of a commitment. And those who have been very fearful of what diplomacy could mean for them, and even though many of their reasonings, in my view, are quite understandable, have also, in my estimation, not fully grasped the opportunities that can exist if you can get a solution. I think one of the best leverages Israel, for instance, has in changing Iran's attitude and approach towards Israel is not by opposing, or in the case of the last year at least, even creating some problems for the diplomatic trap, but to be more supportive of it by making sure, by that, that the concerns of the Jewish state is also on the table. Meaning that there cannot be a full resolution to this unless there is a full resolution to other very critical issues that are affecting us. In, and in this specific case, how would the U.S. and Iran really be able to move towards a greater resolution if there isn't an effort by the Iranians to change, shift, moderate the position on Israel? I think that would be a much more successful <coughs> path to be able to uh, secure the long-term security of the Jewish state rather than the current path. And even though in an election year we will see every side really pat themselves on the back and say that the sanctions are so effective, the bottom line is they are bringing havoc on the Iranian economy. And one can take perhaps some pleasure in that if one is of that uh, orientation. But it's also bringing us much, much closer to a military confrontation. A military confrontation that all sides at least nominally say that they wish to avoid. I'll stop there. Thank you.
Mr. Parsi, thank you very much for coming. It was a very informative lecture for me personally. I have two part question. The first one is there hasn't been much coverage on the alleged air strikes on Sudanese manufacturing plants. What do you think about that? And the second would be what do you think are the chances of Prime Minister Antonyabu to be re elected in January? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, on the issue of the Sudanese bombing, I, I don't have any uh, inside information or anything that I can share with you, except for saying that if you take a look at the larger picture, you're starting to see that some of the stuff that was not overtly in the past are becoming increasingly open, and it's becoming increasingly two-sided. Of course, there's been cyber attacks against the Iranians. We know that now, even the president himself ordered that very early on in his presidency. But now we're also starting to see that there seems to be some pushback or, or some retaliation, whatever you want to call it, from the Iranian side. On the one hand, you have massive um, attacks, cyber attacks, not only against um, uh, Saudi Aramco in Saudi Arabia, but also against Qatar. You have drones, Iranian drones most likely, flying over Israel. The Iranians claim that they have pictures of Imona, I don't know if that's true or not. But there seems to be a significant intensification of the signaling in which both sides are getting much, much closer to the brink of some sort of a confrontation. I don't think there's any real desire on either side. I think they all realize that this would be an extremely unpredictable mess. But it takes a tremendous amount of statesmanship and discipline to be able to walk back from the brink of disaster. And I'm not particularly confident that either side right now has that ability. Particularly mindful when you take a look at their domestic political scenes. It's not as if decisions can be made particularly easy or that the decision-making process is particularly rational. I don't like the conversation about individuals being or not being rational. I think when we take a look at systems, you can make an assessment as to whether the system is geared to be able to make the best possible decisions. I have a hard time saying that for either the Israeli or the Iranian decision-making process right now. Uh, as to whether Netanyahu win or not, I, I rarely make predictions about any elections, uh, but particularly about Israeli or Iranian elections. Um, but um, I don't think it will have a significant impact on the general orientation. The Netanyahu government has now pursued a particularly different line than the previous Israeli government or the one even before that. There's been a lot of differences in tone and style, I would say. And I think particularly in the last year, we've seen something that I think, from the perspective of those who want to see a very strong U.S.-Israeli relationship, should be concerned about, because the, the very vocal and public level of tensions from the people at the highest level, I don't think is particularly helpful. I can tell you that when Netanyahu made a comment after the round of negotiations in Istanbul, it was actually very successful negotiations between the U.S., the P5, and Iran, uh, they agreed on a framework and on principles for negotiations, which is very critical. Um, Netanyahu said that Obama just gave the Iranians a free boot. This deeply, deeply upset the White House, and it added to all of the existing tensions, and ultimately that's not helpful to me this time. Other questions for Dr. Parsi on this side? Yes, Do you think that in the event of a military confrontation between Iran and Israel or the United States, do you think that um, there is a larger polarization that will happen on the region itself? Um, because Iranian influence on other countries, such as Pakistan, um, especially in minority, um, you know, like Shia minorities and stuff, is extremely influential. So you think that that'll also play a part in polarizing the whole region? That's a very good question. I've not come across a single serious planner, either within the Pentagon or in other governments, who do not take that very, very seriously. Now, there's various um, predictions of how significant of uh, instability throughout the region this would cause. Some would think that it would be more limited, but still 
very destabilizing. Someone would think that this could actually lead to a very, very dangerous scenario. Um, I personally tend to believe that it would be very, very foolish to underestimate what this could do throughout the region. Uh, on the one hand, you can make a very um, compelling argument that the Iranian influence throughout the Arab world right now is much, much less. Let me put it this way. Iranian soft power throughout the Arab world is much less now than it was just a couple of years ago. And this is largely because what has happened since 2009, but mostly because what is happening in Syria right now. Um, with uh, uh, the position that the Iranian government has taken in, in regards to Assad and the butchering that he's doing against his own people. But having said that, I think it would still be very, very dangerous to draw some of these conclusions or these rather convenient conclusions that this means that suddenly a military competition of that kind would not have significant impact on the region. On the contrary, I think. Mindful of how the previous conflicts, how that has created a tremendous ripple effect throughout the region. And those conflicts will be smaller than the conflict with Iran. I think one, should have, one has to be very, very careful. And I think at the same time, it's, it's worth mentioning, the US military is clearly not inclined or intent on such a confrontation. This is not something that is driven by them or even favored by them, on the contrary. They're very, very opposed to this. And there's several different reasons for it. They don't believe that the way this mission has been defined at this moment is doable, that is winnable. Not to say that it's not possible, but it's not possible with the means that are being offered. You cannot prevent Iran from having a nuclear capability by just having air strikes. And then when you get into the question of, okay, what, what does that actually mean? Um, some in the Pentagon say, well, it means 500,000 to 600,000 troops an invasion from three sides, another 100 to 200,000 troops from allied countries that have strong militaries, uh, and a 10-year commitment for a 10-year occupation. <coughs> and then they ask the political leadership, so are you willing to commit to that? If you're not willing to commit to that, don't make loose talk about war. And don't spread rumors that you know these things can be resolved um, through a couple of military strikes here and there. Now, from the Israeli perspective, there's, there's a different view. The view is that you can strike surgically and you can delay the program for two or three years. But the Israelis are not making the argument that it will resolve it. They're very cautious, saying this will delay it for two or three years. And then the argument is that two or three years later you may have to do it again. That's a strategy that at times has been successful for Israel within its own immediate neighborhood. But this is not a strategy that is attractive to the United States that ultimately uh, is responsible for a lot of the security of the region. And this is not that something that this is that something that absolutely would create a tremendous amount of ripple effects throughout the region that ultimately the US finds extremely dangerous and, and, and problematic. Um, Hello. Um, I wanted to ask you, you made a statement saying that other countries don't understand who has the power in the United States government. I wanted to ask you, so who do you think has the power? Like the president, Congress? And has the United States done a good job or a bad job changing other countries' perspectives of the United States government? Thank you. I live in Washington. I ask myself that question every day. <laughs> so I'm not surprised that other countries would have uh, question marks. I think it's a very complex uh, and at times difficult to understand process. I think in this specific, on this specific issue, um, the administration has tried to hold this issue extremely tight. Um, you know, there's less meetings in their agency than there has been even during the previous administration. But I would say that the main thing that this administration perhaps has failed to do is that if you want to pursue a policy, you have to create the political space to pursue it and be able to sustain that policy. This administration, when it comes to Iran, but also to a certain extent when it comes to other issues, has had an approach in which it is, instead of creating political space for its policy, has tried to navigate the existing political landscape uh, and trying to get its policy kind of on the cheap at times, without spending much political capital. On this issue in particular, I think that's next to impossible. Adjusting your strategy to a political landscape that has given birth and sustained an enmity for three decades is not going to be successful if, you, if your objective is to change it. If you compare, for instance, Bush's leadership style and Obama's leadership style, uh, I think it's quite um, stark differences. When Bush wanted to go to war with Iran, 
He recognized the need to sell that to the American people to create political space for that policy. Between January 2002 and March 2003, he gave 16 major speeches, spelling out the strategic rationale for going into Iraq. Now, personally, I, my view, those reasons were not legitimate or, or accurate, but nevertheless, he recognized the need to create space for his policy, and he was very hard to do it. In addition to 11 interviews with major outlets by him and Dick Cheney, President Obama gave very passionate speeches about the necessity to pursue this path for strategic reasons as candidate Obama. Once he came into office, I can only find two instances up until this last month or so in which he went out and he actually argued for his policy, spelling out the strategic objectives. Instead, he was trying to get it done without having much of a political debate or fight about it. It may have been a, a, a strategy that could have worked on other issues. On this specific issue, I don't think it's possible. Just as much, I don't think it would be possible for the Iranian government to suddenly move and change three decades of hostility towards the United States just like that, uh, thinking that the rest of the political establishment in Iran would not be up in arms, unless they have been involved in it and unless they have been um, incidentally uh, appraised on it. On the issue of uh, the administration succeeding or not succeeding uh, when it comes to public um, uh, views of the United States, I think in particular when it comes to the Middle East, I think the administration probably is a bit disappointed. And I think it's largely because the administration raised expectations so much, perhaps not as much as they wanted to, but perhaps he raised it a little bit by accident. But many of the speeches the president gave really raised expectations in the Middle East for changes that probably the president was never really intending to pursue or capable of pursuing. And as a result, he's ended up um, really suffering in the polls because people just thought that he would be able to do much more than he has. I think that we are at the end of the 145 uh, time. I wanted again to thank Dr. Parsi, it's absolutely a pleasure to have you.